Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 9 through 18 tonight. Verse 9 through 18, Philippians chapter 2. We're picking up in part of last week's message and moving into this week's, and so we'll kind of end out on last week's or kick off on last week's and then press into what we have for tonight or this week. Amen? Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through, 11, through 18. The Bible says, For this reason also God highly exalted him, and he bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice of your service, of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be holy and acceptable in your sight, for you are my rock and my redeemer. Father God, Lord, we thank you for tonight, the opportunity to gather together as brothers and sisters across or this place this evening in the Emmaus experience. Lord, we also lift up to you, Father God, our Awana ministry for our children between the ages of three and sixth grade in our region ministry, Father God, our teen ministry, Father, that's meeting over in the region building. God, and we ask that across this campus, Lord, that you might bless uh, the people of God, Lord, as they come out to hear the word of God. Lord, and thank you for even on a night like this, God, that the people are hungering and thirsting for your righteousness. And so feed your people fresh manna that falls from heaven. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and thank God. Tonight as we look at Philippians chapter 2, uh, the second half, verse 12 through 17, we like to tag that, pressing on in his power as his people. Pressing on in his, pow in his power as his people. But we're going to also start off tonight closing out last week's with press on with the mentality of unity and humility. Last week we were dealing with Philippians chapter 2, and we got to this section at the very end where we began to talk about the work of Christ, starting in verse 5. So let me start reading from there to lead into what verse 9 says. Verse 5 says, in Philippians 2, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But here it is, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made into the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's Philippians 2, 5 through 8, which leads into verse 9, where we're picking up tonight, where it says, for this reason also God highly exalted him. So if you want to come into this reason, for this reason, verse 9, you really have to go back to verse 5 through 8, where it says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, humbled himself, took on the form of a bondservant, and made himself in the likeness of men. God became the God-man. That God of the universe and the person of Jesus Christ became a human being, put on a human suit, walked around, and subjected himself to the same things that you and I would. 
As we read in John chapter 1, the Bible says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God becomes a man. So you have the God-man, Jesus Christ, 100% God, 100% man. And he humbles himself, and it says this in verse 8, He found himself in appearance as a man, and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That Jesus Christ, when you look at, uh, as we get ready to prepare for, for this reason, it is the humility of the highest of high in the universe to become like the lowest of low. That Jesus Christ, God, equally to God the Father, equally to God the Holy Spirit, agrees in the counsel of the Godhead to become a human being, put on a flesh suit. And as we talked about last week in Acts chapter 2, it was according to God's predetermined plan that Jesus Christ would die on the cross for you and I. Acts chapter 2, verse 23 through 24. That it was a predetermined plan. It was not a reaction to Adam's sin in the garden. That it was prior to the world ever began, as we mentioned in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, that Jesus Christ was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That his role in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, was for Jesus Christ to enter into human experience and die on the cross for mankind. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't say, no, 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 I'm not going. That's not the plan because I'm God just like you. He humbled himself, put on human flesh, walked around, subjected himself. The creator became like the creature in which he created and subjected himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. He humbled himself. And in that humility is where you see the ultimate measure of a man's mentality. It's whether or not a man is going to be, or a woman is going to walk in spiritual humility. Spiritual humility. The opposite of humility is pride. The opposite of humility is not only pride, it's arrogance. And arrogance is always driven by ignorance. Arrogance is always driven by ignorance because you think that you're more than you actually are. And so Jesus Christ, unlike that, being an omniscient God, humbles himself and puts on a human suit and dies on the cross. And the Bible says, because of this, verse 9, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So here's how we move tonight. Paul says we must press on with, a reality of humiliation that leads to spiritual exaltation. We got to have a reality, our real experience, not just our mentality, is that in a real experience, you have to humble yourself. And in humbling yourself, that is when God exalts you. God does not exalt you by you and I talking about how great we are, talking about how gifted we are. That's not how God exalts us. God actually exalts us as we humble ourselves. That when God sees the proper posture of man in his character, that man recognizes his role and obeys his role, that's when God exalts you. We live in a world where everybody's bragging on themselves. Everybody's talking about whether it's sports, whether it's reality TV, whatever it is, everybody's always bragging about how good they are. And here's the amazing thing that if you read your Bible, the Bible says God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you ever want to get God to look ignorant and sideways at you, be prideful. Because God is really wondering, how in the world can you have pride when the only reason that you're breathing right now is because I allow you to? The only reason that you're walking right now is because I allow you to. How in the world can you really have pride when everything about you is in my hands. It, don't, don't you realize that you don't control anything? You didn't even control you getting saved. You didn't control when you were unsaved. I didn't let you go as far as you could have gone. I saved you before you went that far. I control it all. So God says the proper posture for anybody in life is to humble yourself. Now let's look back at what Jesus says in Matthew 23. In Matthew 23, Jesus makes a comment. In 
Matthew 23, verse 8 through 12. Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about the religious leaders of the day who believe that they're all that. And he says this, But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, and he who is the one who is in heaven. So now when he starts talking about don't call anyone rabbi, and then he comes back and says, for you are all brothers, is that there was a position that if you were the rabbi, that you were the head, that you were the lead person, so you were exalted over everyone else. But if you were brothers, you were of equal standing. And so he said there were those who wanted to be called rabbi. Remember, Nicodemus was the lead teacher, leading rabbi of the Israelites in John chapter 3. So therefore, you would highly exalt the rabbi. You would make the, the rabbi seem like he was all that. But at the exact same time that you lifted up the rabbi, you also demoted yourself. So he said, in your realm, don't look at another man as more highly as yourself. Look at that man with sober regard, and that man ought to look at you with sober regard as brothers. And so he says, do not call uh, another one father, for you have one father who is in heaven. R recognize your true origin. But then verse 10 do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant, verse 11. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Matthew 23, verse 11 and 12, begin to start out this mentality on exaltation and humiliation. And it's where Jesus Christ says, if you want to see a real leader, the real leader will be a servant. The real leader will not be one who goes around seeking to be served, because you remember what Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life away as a ransom for many. But the Son of Man did not come for people to serve him. He's not the President of the United States to where he goes through driving in some limousine and people are throwing confetti and waving him. That's not how he rolls. Even when he comes rolling in on a donkey, he comes humble. But here it is, is that Jesus Christ is saying that if you're really going to be a leader, you're going to be a servant. It is a reversal in mentalities because in our realm, people who are leaders are served and exalted by other people. And what he says is real leaders humble themselves and serve the people. And therefore, whoever humbles himself, he will be exalted. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. So God watches the mentality, the posture mentally of individuals. And what God sees is he looks around to notice what's your real posture about who you are in life, who you are on your job, who you are in your family, who you are in, uh, um, in your neighborhood. Who are you when you're in church? Are you someone seeking to be exalted? Are you someone seeking position, or are you seeking to serve other people, and therefore because you're a servant, God sees fit to exalt you? Because a lot of people seeking position capture position on their own. What did Paul say? I'm more extremely zealous about my ancestral tradition. So if you really want a position in the church, you just come in and work real hard, get around the right people, and you'll find yourself in a position just like that. And the deal is, he said, you got it on your own. But here's the big deal, is that when God sees you come in and humble yourself as a servant, then God will position you and exalt you at the right time. Here's what Jesus is laying out. But then walk with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, because when Jesus mentions this comment to the Pharisees, a young man by the name of Peter would have heard it. And now Peter is going to mention something as he talks about the elders of the church in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. He's going to talk about the role of elders in the church in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. But then he's going to come back and say this in verse 5 and 6. He says, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Check out verse 6. 
Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Now, check out verse 5. He just comes off of the elders of 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. Then he transitions from the elders of the church. He says, now, you younger men, he says, here's your posture underneath the elders. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. So that's not just the, the young people having humility towards the elders. It's also elders having humility with the young people as well. In other words, everybody ought to have a posture of humility with one another. Then he comes back and he says, notice this, humble yourselves, why? Because God is opposed to the proud, he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Now notice this in 1 Peter 5, 6. Exaltation does not come from the elders. Exaltation comes from God. So he's showing them inside this church structure where young men might see, I'm next up. It's, it, it's my turn next. I, I, I'm getting ready. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That while you are subject to elders and you walk in, in humility with them and they walk in humility with you, that your number one position and posture ought not be, or am I in good with the elders? Your number one position and posture ought to be, have I humbled myself before God? And if God sees fit to use me, God will exalt me at the proper time. Humility. That, 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 that if there are people who are seeking position, the Holy Spirit of God who is going to exalt. Now watch this. God allows the elders or a lead elder to choose other elders and also position people in positions of leadership inside the church. Now, if the Holy Spirit, because the Bible says in Acts 20, that the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Acts 20, verse 28, the Holy Spirit made you overseers. But Titus 1 says, hey, uh, Titus, you choose the elders. So God chooses the elders through a man who has the Holy Spirit working inside of him, and the Holy Spirit is in control of the process. So now watch this. If you come with the wrong posture, male and or female, and I'm not just talking about the position of elder, in leadership in the church, God will reveal to the elders by the Holy Spirit that this person's got wrong motives. See, God, God will reveal if you don't believe that this thing is a clique and dudes are just choosing who they like, but if you believe that people are choosing based on the Holy Spirit, move them to choose who they chose, then you'll realize that the reason why you ought to humble yourself to God and not to man is because if you're humbling yourself to man, God will point that out and show you you got a wrong motivation. He said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. I'm here to serve the God who saved me in line and humbly with the leaders that God has given me. And when God sees that humility in you, he then allows the elders to see that humility in you, and those elders reach out to you, and they draw you up. Now notice this. In Acts chapter 16, verse 1 through 5, if you want to write that down, the apostle Paul comes to Lystra. And as the apostle Paul comes to Lystra in Acts 16, 1 through 5, there were some older men who made this comment. Man, there's a young disciple named Timothy that dude got it going on. Some older men in the church recognized to the Apostle Paul, this young dude named Timothy is a solid brother. And God used the recommendation of other men to, 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 to Paul, and the Bible says that Paul wanted this man to go with him. Timothy didn't raise his hand and ask to go. Other people recognized he was worthy to go. When you begin to serve with a Jesus Christ-minded mentality inside the local church, you never have to do anything to exalt yourself because God has enough room in the church for people to serve people. And he has enough room in the church to place you in a position to serve other people if that's the motivation. But if the motivation is I want to be around these guys, I want to seem important, God will make sure that you don't get there. Did you hear what I said? Now, notice this. The Bible says that there ought to be men that aspire to the office of elder. You know, you, you ought to have some aspirations, some spiritual aspirations. I, I'd like to get there. I'd like to be ready to serve the body of Christ like that. But not to so-called lead, but to serve. To train, to teach, to build up, to invest in. And so here it is. Notice the language, verse 6 of 1 Peter 5. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you, notice this, at the proper time. 
that there's not only exaltation, but notice this, exaltation is on the way. But exaltation may not be today. Because God may be working on some character issues or working on something in your life, and at the proper time, when God has you ready, that's when God exalts you. That God is not going to exalt you before you are ready for the job. In other words, when God puts you in place, you may not feel ready, but God will never put you in place if he doesn't believe that you're ready. And not ready based on your ability, but based on his ability through you to get done what God has called you to do. You're being in tune with God. And this is male and or female. God is not just looking at you and saying, uh, you know, no, you're not ready. God is saying, I'm developing some things in you. Notice this. Joseph, and we go all the way back to the series we did a couple years, uh, about a year and a half ago. We did a series called When God is for You on the Life of Joseph. And when we did that series, Joseph wanted to get out of prison. He said, hey, man, I didn't do nothing wrong. Get me out of prison. It was two years later when Joseph came out of prison. God did not exalt Joseph until the proper time. Why? Because Pharaoh had to have a dream and if Joseph would have gotten out of prison when he thought he was ready to get out of prison, Pharaoh didn't have a dream, and Joseph wouldn't have been in position to fulfill God's mission. Whenever God promotes you, it's because he has the proper time on your life to fulfill something that he's called you to do. See, God doesn't promote you based on you ever. He always promotes you based on what he's going to do for somebody else. Never think in your life, that promotion for you in the body of Christ is individual. Never. It is always for somebody else. Why? Because the reason that I gift you, gifted you is to edify the body of Christ. So God has timing in place. There, there are people, I remember, and, and I've shared this with you probably, but, but, but I, I knew that Pastor Lawson at Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church should have hired me as his youth pastor. I, I knew he should have hired me. There was no way I was supposed to come to the north side of town. I, I was supposed to be in a Trey Ward, ministering with Pastor Lawson, you know, hanging out and doing my stuff over at Yates and over at uh, Ryan Middle School and, and Thompson and, and all that. I, I, I'm supposed to be over there doing my thing, Cullen. I'm supposed to be doing my thing over there in the Trey. And I remember going to tell Pastor Lawson, Pastor Lawson, hey, this church on the northwest side, man, they want me to come be their youth pastor. And, uh, and so I'm telling him that, thinking that Pastor Lawson would say, oh, no, we can't let you get away. And so, and so, so, no, 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 Blake, we, we're going to put an offer on the table for you. Now, I, I knew that was what he was going to do. So, I, you know, I, I'm telling him, you know, Pastor Lawson, yeah, this church, they, they're, they're interested in me being a youth pastor. And so, you know, I just want to come and tell you what, what, what you're going to do. That, that, that's really what I was thinking. Pastor Lawson said, Blake, it'll be the best decision you've ever made. I'm like, now, hold up, man. You're supposed to, like, like ask me to, to, to stay here. No, it'll be great for you, Blake. Go. No, that, that's not what you're supposed to do, Pastor Lawson. It wasn't my time. I was too immature to be the youth pastor of all those hundreds of kids. So I'm going to start you out with three. And it's going to grow from three to 27. And after 27, I'm going to send you to First Met. And after that, I'm going to send you somewhere else. But I'm going to bring you up slowly because you can't handle what you think you're ready to handle. See, see God is so good, I didn't realize how carnal-minded I was even when I was at Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. There were some things he had to change in me, in my mentality, my view of ministry that had to change before he could ever put me there. And now I praise God because I was too stupid to be the youth pastor. It actually meant that Pastor Lawson was in tune and said, no, you dumb. Please go to somebody else's church and be dumb. P please go to somebody else's church and be dumb. They can help handle your level of stupidity. Amen? Now, here it is. So Philippians, go back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Philippians 2, verse 9 through 11. So Paul says, For this reason God highly exalted him, and he bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That Jesus Christ has a name that stands above all. He has a name that that stands above all, that there is something about the name Jesus, that the Bible says that there is no other name by which men can be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 4, that Jesus Christ 
has the highest rank and the highest exalted name as the Son of God in the earth realm. That there is no other name greater than that name. And God has given him that name highest because he became the lowest. God gave him the highest name because he became the lowest. Notice this. Not only does he give him the highest name, but he says this. That at his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, here's the interesting thing. Every knee is going to bow to Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, is when? Because not all knees are bowed right now. You have people of other faiths. You have people that don't acknowledge him. You have atheists. You have agnostics. You have all kinds of people who, at the end of the day, think Jesus is a joke. But watch the text move. Right here in Philippians chapter 2, he says this. In verse 9, he says that at the knee, he is highly exalted and bestowed on the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow of those who are, watch, in heaven, one, on earth, two, and under earth, three. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father. He gives you three realms of confession. Every person already in heaven has acknowledged him as Lord. That is dead and is already in heaven, they've acknowledged him as Lord. But then there's men that are still on earth. So when Christ comes back, those that uh, are still here, they will recognize him. Let's just say if it's at the rapture, they're going to recognize him as Lord. At the rapture. That's another time where Christians will recognize him as Lord and he comes back. But that's not the only time. There's going to be those at the second coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 19, I'd write that down. So you got the 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 recognizers at the rapture. You got the Revelation 19 at the great, uh, 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 the second coming battle. At the second coming Revelation 19, they're going to all acknowledge him, Revelation 19. And then in Revelation 20, when he comes back at the final end, there are going to be those who are going to recognize him and go to the great white throne judgment for all non-believers. But he says this, those that are on earth, whether that's during the rapture or during the second coming or during uh, which, which leads into the millennial kingdom or those that come back at the end of the age, but everybody on earth will acknowledge him. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, and every eye will see him. See, at the rapture, not every eye will see him, only believers will. The non-believer will be blinded to the return of Christ. But at the second coming of Christ, all eyes will see him. All eyes will see him. Now here's the deal, and those under the earth, those that are already dead and in hell, are going to have to come back and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. So here's the deal, you're going to have seasons of believers recognizing him at the rapture. You're going to have seasons of believers recognizing him at the kingdom. When he's going to take, uh, uh, and then you're going to have non-believers recognizing him uh, at the great white throne. But watch this. Even those in hell who don't believe before you are finally tossed into the lake of fire must acknowledge. So watch this. Think about this. A dude died, let's just say, let's just say a guy dies in 2018. Let's just believe that in 2025, the rapture hits. Seven years from now, the rapture hits. Boom. So now, this dude's been dead seven years. Then now, the millennial kingdom, the, the rapture goes into play. So that's 2030. I mean, the, 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 the tribulation goes into play. That's 2032, seven years. Then there's the millennial kingdom goes into play, a thousand years. So this dude has been in the grave 1,014 years in hell. Then at the great white throne judgment, hell is tossed up to the great white throne to be judged by God and all the participants in it. And at that deal, he will look in the Lamb's Book of Life one more time, pull you out a brief reprieve out of hell, look on the list and say, you ain't make it, homie. And then toss you into the lake of fire. And before I toss you into the lake of fire, you have to recognize the one on the great white throne is Jesus Christ as Lord. But the problem is, is you recognize too late. So everybody will acknowledge that he's Lord, but only those that uh, acknowledge that he's Lord on earth will be the ones that get saved. You can't acknowledge him afterward and get saved. You've got to acknowledge him before. 
So every non-believer will have full identity of who Christ is on that day and then be tossed into the lake of fire. So when he says, I've given him the name that is above all names, and the Bible talks about in 1 Peter 4 that God is going to judge the living and the dead, it simply means that everybody is going to be subject to Christ. I don't care what your friend's opinion is on Jesus Christ. I don't care what your family member's friend is on Jesus Christ. There will be a day that every man answers to him and him alone. For he is king of all and lord of all. Now, therefore, Christ is the one of high exaltation of God. Without the Son, there's no opportunity to the Father. And without the Father, there's no opportunity to the Son. So, let's deal real quick. First set of questions. Goes back to some of last week. How do you see yourself giving up rights of your own in order to express humility for the benefit of others? Do you honestly struggle with the feeling of being recognized? Now, remember last week, I, I started out the beginning of this week with Philippians 2.5, is that everybody ought to have this attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, that he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. He did not grasp equality with God. So this question really comes from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. So as you walk through and answer this question, you can read through Philippians 2, 5 through 8. But it's how do you see yourself giving up your rights and your stuff to, to humbly serve other people? And then do you honestly struggle with feeling of being recognized? Because here's the reality. Some people, as a child, were not recognized by people. Listen to me very carefully. And we bring our humanity issues into the Christianity family. And because somebody didn't acknowledge me as a child, I come into the church and I want to get acknowledged. Because, see, some folk realize I didn't get accepted in the world, but the church folk, they're supposed to accept me. So now I want to run towards acceptance and acknowledgement and recognition in the church. And you and I have to be real about do we struggle with recognition issues. Because if you struggle with recognition issues, you're going to always be mad at leadership when they don't choose you. Amen? And the reality is, is you ought to be mad at yourself because of your recognition issues. Because you want leadership to choose you, therefore God didn't allow leadership to choose you. Well, I just said something right there, amen? Y'all going to handle that, all right? How do you see yourself giving up rights of your own in order to express humility for the benefit of others? Do you see yourself doing that? I know that we all talked about it a little bit last week, but I want you to deal with it some today. Do you honestly struggle with the feeling of being recognized? Five, five, seven minutes. It's a chance to get deep now if you have recognition issues going on and tell the truth. Don't be lying up in here, amen. No, I humbly serve the Lord and um, I'm so thankful for him.
All right, we got about two minutes. All righty, we down to 30 seconds, 30 seconds. All righty, all righty, let's roll, let's roll. As we talk about this issue of how do you see yourself giving up rights of your own in order to express humility for the benefit of others. There's some things that Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, as very God of very God, uh, did not have to give up, but he willingly gave up. And so he had a position, and so he humbles himself, he puts on human suit. So what are some rights that you might have had in your life, in your personal experience, to where you, you, you set that aside in order to express humility for the benefit of others. Come on, somebody. All right, here we go, fives. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, um, prior to my job now, I lost my job and then I went into the education field as like a, um, a substitute teacher. And um, the position that they put me in was uh, the life skills students. So during that, um, during that time, they put me with like a, a special case kid, but they didn't tell me they would put me with a special case kid. Oh. So it was very, very trying like every day, dealing with um, somebody that was dealing with like split personalities and that kind of stuff. So I found myself with this, uh, with this guy every single day. So at first the job they said, you wanna be all around all the kids, but they put me specifically with this one individual. So every day I would have to watch this kid every day. I would have to watch him, you know, do the same thing every single day to keep him sane. And um, I used to struggle with that because I didn't, I couldn't understand, you know what I mean? Um, you know, why I was in this situation, you know, to be here with this kid and I'm struggling and I'm not, I'm barely making it myself right now. But it was uh, one day we were walking on the track and I would like, you know, secretly like sometimes just pray. And then um, one day he was walking on the track and me and him was just talking. And I, something told me to say, you know, you know, start talking talking about Jesus to him. So I just start talking about Jesus to him a little bit. And I was like, Brandon, you love the Lord? He's like, yeah, I love the Lord. And then um, we just started talking, man. And it was like this, uh, this feeling of joy that came over me. And then we had an incident where he just lost it, just completely lost it. But in that same thing, I was able to have more compassion toward him in that, in, in that situation because I felt like we were going through all these different things and I could recognize more now. Why I was in the, why I was in the situations versus being like why he got me here with this kid is mm -hmm. I'm going through this, but it was in that it was in that time I was able to like really humble myself 
and see the reason why I care about people so much. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else? Y'all too humble to go to talk, I understand. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. They're coming. They're coming. Mine is actually for the second question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you honestly struggle with feeling of being recognized? Good. I, I do. I, I actually recently struggled with that at my job, which is kind of something similar to the other um, gentleman. But um, recently, uh, the sales in my market has been down at my job and I knew it was my fault. It was my boss fault. He's being greedy with the with the with the numbers. And you know, that's how I looked at it. I complained to people about it. I'm like, man, I was killing the market last year. Here we go this year. You know, he had to get a little greedy. But you know, I had to to, you know, take myself out of it and think back and you know, and I was like, you know what? I'm not even tripping no more after I did all my venting, of course. Um, but I was like, I'm not even tripping. You know what? I'm going to do my job. I prayed about it. I'm like, Lord, you know, it ain't, it ain't really me that's making these sales. You bring these people to me. You know, this, this, is, this is you who brings it to me, and you're the one that's doing it in my life. So, you know, please, please bring this business so I can kill it again. Um, but I stopped complaining about what somebody else was doing and humbled myself and, you know, they're still on top of me about, you know, what's, what's not picking up, even though I feel like, you know, technically it's not my fault. I just had to let that go. And ever since I did that, I just been like booking like crazy. It's, 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 it's all God when we humble ourselves and, and, you know, take the pressure off of other people so they won't look bad. And I just, I take it in because I know he works miracles in my life and he does everything um, and when we humble ourselves, and once I did that, I've been, you know, blessed to make make good sales. Even though, you know, they originally looked at me like I was the the problem. And you know, I'll take that. It is what it is. Amen. Amen. Now, listen. Um, as you deal with issues like like this this Philippians two passage, let me let me go back to something real quick. In Philippians two, go back to uh, verse two, which precedes verse five. He says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now watch this. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. That's the big deal. When it comes down to um, giving up your rights, giving up your rights is by acknowledging that someone else is just as important as you are. But as long as you come in the room and you're the central attraction in the room, as long as you are the main piece in the room in your mind, then you're going to always be focused on you. But he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard other people as more important than you. Come in saying, how can I serve others, not how can I be served? How can I help other people? And so that's where Jesus Christ, when he comes in, he comes in in this human suit to say, how can I help the dying world? His number one goal for coming in is to come in and help a dying world that could not help himself. He's not serving himself, he's serving others. So when you and I start looking at this whole deal of, of taking off or giving up our rights to uh, express humility for the benefit of others, it all starts off with mentality. If you think you're the number one person in the room, you're going to be the number one person in the room, and you're going to always be fighting other people to maintain position, to maintain position in the room, to maintain your posture. But when you believe that other people are important and you make your teammates great, one thing that they talk about in the sports world is if a guy's a really great player, he's not just good, he makes his other teammates great. They always talk about that in the sports world. If you can score all day long like Trey Young from Oklahoma, and yeah, I know he gets some assists, but I don't think Trey all that. Y'all don't even know who I'm talking about. I, I understand, I understand. But, 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 but Trey going to score 55, and they still going to lose. He's going to be giving the ball up at the end of the game, you know, against Texas, against West Virginia. and he, he, No, 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 because you shoot too much. I don't see nobody else on the team averaging. The, oh, you, I know you can score, but see, if it's about you, and it's about one and done for you, then you really made nobody else better. Can anybody else be the one and done because of you? And so that's the mentality of when you are serving with other people, your whole design is to make other people great. 
That's your whole design of service is to lift up somebody else. But if you struggle with being recognized, then it's going to be all on you. So I, I just want to make, make sure that we deal with the mentality that Christ had before we move on to this next part. So let's move on to verse 12 through 14. Because verse 12 through 13 is going to set up something after what we just talked about. Notice verse 12 of Philippians chapter 2 says this. So then, based on everything that we just talked about, my beloved, just as you have already obeyed, uh, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. Notice this. Paul says we must press on by working out while God is working in us to experience his power, his purpose, and his pleasure. Now notice that he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He does not say, work for your salvation. He says, work out your salvation. Very simple, is that if you're in the gym, you're working out on muscles because you already have a membership. You're working out to increase, to improve, to build on what you already have. You're going in the gym to build on, to perfect, to chisel, to tighten up what you already have. It's because you have membership that you can go in the gym and access it. So he doesn't say work for your salvation. He says work out your salvation. In other words, work because you're already saved in such a way that you can grasp hold of your salvation and know that you got that thing. Now, he says, now while God is wants you to work out, that's your obedience to the plan. He says, God is working in. So here's the benefit of you working out. As you obey, he says, Paul says, I want you to obey now, that not just because I was present. It's easy to obey while pastor's there. But when pastor's not around, will you obey? So the issue now is an issue of obedience. He's trying to get them to obey in his absence. So he says, as you obey, and you begin to work out your salvation and prove to people and prove to yourself that you're saved and that you're growing and that you're maturing, realize this, God is the one working in. So as soon as you begin to obey the will of God, you get somebody to kick in that you didn't know that you had working on your, beside, on your behalf. See, as soon as you embrace with the mind of Christ, with the Holy Spirit, you know what, I'm going to obey God's way. Y'all, there's so many ways that we choose a lack of obedience in our own plan. And when we choose lack of obedience in our own plan, God does not work in. But when you obey and begin to work out, God begins to work in. Okay, I'm going to give y'all a simple example. Break up with him. Holy Ghost said it. No. See, I, I really liked it him. Y'all know how we be saying liked it? I had liked it him. And so you don't break up with him because you had liked it him and you know that you need to break up with him so God doesn't work in. So now you wonder why seven years later you're still not married because you didn't work out when he told you to. And if you would work out when he told you to, I could give you this dude right here, but you're still dealing with the fool. Work out so I can work in. Obey so that I can show up and do some stuff in your life. You got to work out so that God can work in. Now watch this. Paul says we must press on by working out while God is working in us to experience his power, his purpose, and his pleasure. Now notice this. Verse 12, he says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as, much, uh, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, take your salvation seriously. When he says, with fear and trembling, he says, it literally means to fear the Lord. If we were in Proverbs, uh, the beginning of all knowledge, Proverbs 1, 7, uh, the beginning of all knowledge is the fear of God. Beginning of all knowledge, all wisdom is the fear of God. That's salvific. Proverbs 3 says this, fear God, verse 7, and turn from evil. Fear God and turn from evil. So in other words, Fearing of God is both salvific and sanctification. So when he says, when you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, you're working it out, realizing that God is working in your life. Therefore, you want to please God, and you recognize, I want to walk in an humble way with God to where God can see 
that I'm working in agreement with him. Work it out in fear and trembling. Don't walk around casually with the greatest deposit in your life being salvation as if you don't have it. Don't, don't, don't walk around fearless and, and, and not trembling and live like a fool and one day you're going to meet with God face to face. See, you can either work out now in fear and trembling and stand in confidence, 1 John chapter 2, when God comes back to judge, or you'll stand in fear when God comes back to judge, 1 John chapter 4. Now, now, I just laid some stuff out on you because here's the deal. You're not just going to heaven. You're going to heaven to get judged by God. And in 1 John chapter 2, he says that you ought to, when he comes back, you ought to have confidence when Christ comes back. That you can stand before God in heaven with confidence on the day of judgment. 1 John 2, verse 28. Why? Because you feared God on earth and you acted like God was real. But when you don't fear God, you act like God's not really around. Therefore, you run your show. You do your own thing. You misrepresent God. You don't work out your salvation. And as a result, when you get to heaven and you stand before God, now you're in fear. Because you didn't realize God's holding you accountable. He's not going to toss you out of heaven, but God is going to hold you accountable for everything you did while you were on earth. That's the real deal. Heaven will not be the same for everybody. It will not be the same experience for everybody. That's, that's not true. You're not going to get to heaven and get the same thing Billy Graham got. You're not going to get to heaven and get the same thing Dr. Tony Evans got. No, that's not going to happen. Unless you obey to the degree that they obey, and you're faithful to the degree that God calls you to be faithful over what he's called you to, then that's when you'll experience it. But if not, you're not going to experience that. That's just the reality of the truth. And so Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now notice this. The good news is, is God's working in. Y'all, this is good news right here. He says, God, if you want to experience his power, he says, you need to know that God is working in. Now notice this. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. Now, here's the good news. God gives you his power for his purpose, for his pleasure. So when God is working in you, God is always working for his pleasure to do something that pleases him. Y'all, whenever God is working in you, developing you in an area, like Jason said at first, I didn't know why, but then I figured it out. Sis said, I didn't know why, but then I figured it out. That is God working in you for his good pleasure. What God is doing most of the time in your life and mine is changing our attitude and actions, changing our character and our motivations. The main thing that God is doing is changing your internal character to make you Christ-like in your mentality. So that when he makes you Christ-like in your mentality, it works itself out in the reality of your experience. So a lot of times what God is showing you is, Blake, you too ignorant to get hired right now. You thought Pastor Lawson was going to hire you. Dummy, no, he ain't going to hire you. You're too ignorant. And I had to realize I was ignorant, had to realize I needed to grow up, had to realize I had to mature, and that was God blessing me. I'm showing you you're not ready for that. But watch this. God is never designed when he's working in you to hurt you. He's working in you for his good pleasure. Now, you might get hurt in the process, but he's still working for his good pleasure. Amen? So when you really study the lives of people in the Bible, like Joseph, and different people in the Bible, it's nothing, nothing came easy. You don't see any, David, you're going to be the king. Oh, man, I appreciate that. Hey, why Saul trying to kill me? Moses, go deliver my people. Okay, all right, Pharaoh, let my people go. No, I ain't going to let them go. So you never see anybody get anything easy. Why? Because God is working in and working out for his good pleasure. Showing you what he's accomplishing in your life. Now, let's, let's see why is this important. Underline that God is working in you. Underline that. Now, walk back with me just one book to Ephesians chapter 2. You ought to be happy when the Bible says in Philippians 2, verse 13, that God is working in you. I know a lot of folk get excited about Jeremiah 29, 11. I know y'all get really excited. God, I know the plans he got for me. Plan for hope in the future. Plan for me, not to harm me. I know y'all get excited. Y'all better get excited about that Philippians 2. See, ain't nobody on TV preached that yet, and that's why it's not popular. But they preached Jeremiah 29 11, that's popular. But you ought to be excited about this Philippians 2, verse 13. Check out Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3. I'm going to show you why you ought to be excited. In Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3, it says this. 
And you were dead in trespasses and sins. Before you were saved, you were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you formerly walked, you lived in it. Now watch this. According to the course of this world, you were under the world's influence. According to the power of the air, of the spirit, that is now, underline this, working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But here's the big deal, verse 2, that there was this spirit that was working in us. The Greek word is the word energeriso, energizer bunny. Why does the energizer bunny hop? Because of the battery that's on the inside. The energizer bunny does not hop on its own. The Energizer Bunny only hops when you put the battery on the inside. He said, what you need to know is that before you were saved, there was a different spirit working in you. It was the spirit of the devil that was guiding you towards lust of flesh and mind in which you and I indulged on the highest level. But now that you're saved, God energizes you. God removed your Duracell battery and put his Holy Spirit energizer battery inside you, and now God is the one working in you for his good pleasure. What God is doing in your life now is he has exchanged a defunct system that was in us that guided us towards death and engagement in lust of flesh and mind, and we were being moved by the devil to where now God is moving in us to do something for his good pleasure. See, 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 here's the deal, that you now have access by the Holy Spirit for God to work in you. You are no longer bound by the enemy. All these Christians walking through, oh man, the devil's all over me. No, the Holy Spirit's in you. See, you, you giving the devil all this credit about how the devil got me bound, the devil moved. Man, quit giving the devil all them props when you got God working on the inside of you to both will and work for his good pleasure. The devil, the devil, nothing. I'm not, I'm not being silly about the devil. Understand what I'm saying? But you act like you don't got the Holy Ghost. See, too many Christians do not live victorious, and they live all burdened down, all beat down. Y'all, the sad Christian, you reason why you're sad? Because you're not using the Spirit. You have no obedience, so God is not working in, and you ain't working out. These are critical verses to the Christian faith. See, when you hear a word to obey, man, a word to, God says you are blessed in what you do. Don't be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. For those that do are blessed in what they do. When somebody gives you a word from God, obey. But is your flesh overruling obedience? Is your desire overruling obedience to keep you in the sorry situation you remain in. Y'all, you mean to tell me cats got the Holy Ghost and we live this sorry? You know, you know what's the score, y'all? The devil 63, us too. How you get to a safety? The, the devil, you know, ball went out, you know, when they tried to punt, went out to the back of the end zone, we got a safety. You mean, you mean we got the Holy Ghost and we got two points? Let me show you something in Colossians real quick because y'all don't even believe what I'm telling you. Go to Colossians real quick. Colossians 2. In Colossians chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 8. This is going to be in the second part of the Set the Captives Free series, actually, on spiritual captivity. See to it that no one takes you captive. I'm in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of the men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, fully God, fully man. And in him you have been made complete. In him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. 
And in him you also were circumcised with the circumcision not made with hands in the removal of the body of the flesh of the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, He also, whom he also raised from the dead. Now watch this. And when you were dead in transgression and sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions. Watch this. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us that was hostile against us, and he has taken it out of the way. Watch this. Having nailed it to the cross. Now watch this. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through him. Verse 15. You didn't even know when to shout. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 talks about spiritual warfare. And in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against rulers and authorities and wickedness in high places. That's Ephesians chapter 6. But what Colossians chapter 2 says is that because Ephesians chapter 2 is about Christ starting the church. But Colossians is about Christ being the head of the church. Ephesians is a book about Christ and the church. But Colossians is about Christ as the head of the church. So when it says he disarmed the rulers and authorities, that when Christ died on the cross and was buried and was raised, that he literally took away all power of the enemy and disarmed them. So now watch this. In the mornings, y'all, I, let, let me give y'all some secrets. In the mornings, I come up here and work out early in the morning. Me and a couple brothers, we come up early in the morning and work out. Now, I get here first, and I always have a glass in my hand. Because when I get up here early, in case a fool is in the parking lot, I'm going to put something on him with his glass, all right? Now, I don't, bring my, I don't bring my piece. I don't bring my piece, but I have one. But I've got this glass in case you act a fool up here, and I'm going to get you. Now, here's the deal. But if a dude came at me, because then I started thinking this day, this morning when I was coming up, I said, now, I got a glass. What if he got a gun? So, I mean, he don't have to get close to me, but, but you know, you know, but if you get close, I'll pop him outside the head. I mean, like, I got you, fool, what's up, what's up, what's up, you know. So, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. If a dude comes up to me in the parking lot and says, stick him up with your finger, y'all, you don't understand. See, if a dude has a gun with no bullets in it, he's been disarmed. How are you allowing the devil to hold up your life when he's been disarmed. Christ disarmed him at the cross. So he can't hold you up no more. You stopping for a dude with no bullets. You're allowing him to take things, freedom and liberty out of your life that he has no rights to take. So here's the deal. You have Christ working in you. You have Jesus Christ working in you. How in the world are you losing to an already defeated foe? How are you losing to a foe that has no artillery? Now, this, this is Bible. And we're walking around captured and all. Oh. Y'all, this cannot be the 76th time you're in debt. You can't lose financially all the time. You can't. You're not supposed to. You're living below the freedom level that God has designed. I'm not even talking about no prosperity and you buying 85 cows and, and, and buying some Benzes and all that. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about you, you just ain't supposed to be in debt. Now, I ain't saying you can't have no house debt. I'm just saying you can't be barely making it all the time. That ain't how God has designed your life. Not his design. So here it is. Go back to Philippians 2. Philippians 2, he says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not in my presence only, but now much more my absence. Now, now i got to go back to the beginning of verse 12. As you have obeyed. Y'all, I've told you this before. When you read Deuteronomy 28, it is the setup. Listen, it's the setup. Verse 1 through 14, if you obey, I bless. You disobey, 15 through 68, 69, I curse. You will always see this. Now I'm going to go to New Testament, John 14. If you obey, I reveal, I bless. Whenever there is obedience, there's always blessing. Whenever there's disobedience, there's always cursing. Always. 
cursing or discipline. So if you find yourself always living under the curse, recognize there's some disobedience in your life. Just as you have always obeyed in my presence, now much more in my absence. Amen? Obedience is the key to God working in. You work out. How do you start working out? By obedience. What has God said? Obey what he said. You know, my dad was coaching his team in college, and uh, they were beating the team who was the NAIA national champion the year before. And they were beating the NAIA national champion the season before in this game. They had a guy on their team, Sammy Green, who was going off. Sammy had 38. They were playing against Michael Carter from this other team, Concordia Lutheran in Austin. He had about 35. I mean, it was a war of a game. I'm in there going crazy. Dad has this guard out of Texas City, uh, Donnie Dixon. Dad lines up to play for the end of the game. We get the ball. Ball going to Sammy. We score the bucket, and we win the game. It's over. They can't stop Sammy. Sammy got 38 points, six foot eight. They get the ball. He said, get the ball to Sammy about eight, nine seconds. Let Sammy go to work. Y'all, they got the ball about 15 seconds in. We got the ball. Boom. Donnie's dribbling. Donnie's dribbling. It goes nine seconds. They said, get to Sammy. Eight seconds. Get to Sammy. Seven seconds. Get to Sammy. Five seconds. Four seconds. Two seconds. One second. And Donnie Dixon launches up a three. Misses. My dad said, Donnie, what, what were you doing? I just thought I could make it. Was that the play we called, Donnie? Donnie, you got, you got four points. Sammy got 38. It looked like Sammy being a little bit more consistent. But no, we called the play to get it into Donnie, and you ran your own play. Every time you hear the word of God, God is calling a play. And if you run your own, expect the same results. God is calling plays. Check it out, Philippians. I'm, I'm just in verse 12. So then, beloved, just as you have always obeyed, obedience always brings blessing. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. You ought to be experiencing the pleasure of God in your life. You ought to be experiencing God's pleasure. Here it is. Next thing. 14 and 15. Check this out. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Notice this. Paul says we must press on with a positive perspective proving to be God's people among negative people. This verse 14, he said, now I want you to do everything based on the fact that you know that God is working in you as you work out and you obey, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now, he says, here's the big deal. God uses the difficult trials and seasons of our lives and our obedience in doing it without grumbling and or complaining to prove that we're the people of God. Now, notice this. He starts out by saying, do everything without grumbling or complaining, or grumbling or disputing. What are the children of Israel known for in the desert? Are the children of Israel known for fasting and praying, or are they known for grumbling and complaining? They're known for grumbling and complaining. And therefore, their leader, Moses, gets hot with them because they're always grumbling and complaining. And God said, they, they ain't grumbling and complaining against you, they're grumbling and complaining against me. Now watch this. Every time you find yourself in a difficult situation, or I find myself in a difficult situation, and we grumble and complain, what we're saying is, God, you got us in the wrong situation. If God is working out everything, both to will and work for your good pleasure, God already has the end in mind, but he's got to take you through the process. But when you grumble and complain, you're acting as if God doesn't have your back in the middle of the situation. So now watch this. He says what it does is it proves you to be innocent and blameless, children of God, lights in the world. That's what it proves you to be among a perverse generation. In other words, it shows you off as the people of God as you do the things with a mindset focused on Christ. 
that as I go through, when trial comes my way, I'm not going to grumble, I'm not going to complain. Why? Because I'm going to watch God work. The reason why I don't have to grumble and complain is because I'm going to watch God work in as I work out. Now, the situation I find myself in, I'm going to obey. So if I got a corrupt, jacked up boss on the job, 1 Peter chapter 2 says, don't just obey good bosses, obey stupid bosses. That's Bible. So, you know, you got Christians, you know, they, they get real deep. Oh, I, I don't work for a believer. Well, don't nobody work for a no believer. Joe Chin worked for me. He don't even hardly work for a believer, amen? So, like, that ain't past. Y- y'all better wonder about pastor. But, but, but the reality is, is, is you're not going to work for all these believers who just love Jesus and promote you. You're going to work in some difficult situations. And he says, and now here's the deal. The Bible says, obey us, foolish boss, 1 Peter 2. And you're experiencing the will of God as you do it. That's in the book. Now, don't nobody want to hear that. The Bible says, even when you have an ignorant president, at least pray for the king. At least honor him. Now, he ignorant as all ignorant can be. He, he just is silly and dumb as all can, so silly and dumb can be. But at the exact same time, we can't hate him the same way they hated Barack. Now, I, I done got political for a second. Y'all, y'all, y'all all nervous in the service. Now, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. See, it is the will of God that you pray for the president. Now, now, now see, something. the problem is why some of y'all not going to pray, because y'all not going to really pray. God, I don't like the president. I think he's ignorant and a fool. Can you do something about him? That's a prayer. That's a prayer. That's, that's real. God, I'm, I'm just so thankful for the president. He's just such a great man. He really honors people the way he talks about them. No, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's a fool, God. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when he talks about people, I got Bible on him. God, I don't think that he's honoring people's lives the way he speaks about people of all races, of all different backgrounds, of all, of all situations in life. So, God, I, I, that's why I don't like him. See, if you don't want to pray real, then don't be real. No, God, I don't like him. Amen? And it ain't because he's a Republican. I don't, because he's probably even not, not even that either. He's just a fool. Now, I don't lost about 85 followers off the internet. <laughs> here's the deal. But here's the deal. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Did you see, did you see that? See, when it comes down to doing all things, is will you commit to prayer for the president? Look here, I done lost y'all now. It ain't no amen. It ain't no amen in church. All right, that's it. Let's pray. Let's pray. This is over. Watch no offering tonight. They don't want, you know. See, see, when he says do all things without grumbling and complaining, is that God is showing you, I'm going to put you in some difficult situations. But when you're in difficult situations, I want you to do everything without grumbling and complaining. Why? Because of what you know from the previous verse. I'm working in you. I'm working in you. And I'm working something out through you for my good pleasure. Watch this. God has to allow Joseph to be sold into slavery, although that doesn't feel good, to be lied on in Potiphar's house and be put in prison to reveal a dream for him to come out to reveal Pharaoh's dream so that he can ultimately save his people. He's got to go through 13 years of hell and that he went through as a slave and as a person in prison for 13 years before God brings him out. Y'all, we want everything to work in one day for us because we got microwave Christianity. If God doesn't fix it today, if God doesn't fix it today, he must not be paying, my, paying attention to my prayers. How can you say he's not paying attention when the Bible just said he's working in for his good pleasure? The question is, will you go to the end And then will you not grumble and complain? Why? Because while other people are around looking at how you're going through, you prove to be a witness, to be a child of God, a light in the world, as you don't grumble and complain, knowing that God is working, and therefore they see that you're the light of the world. Let's look at this verse, and I'm going to let you go. Philippians 2, 14 and 15, he says this, Do all things without grumbling and complaining, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Now notice this. Verse 15 says, so that you will prove yourselves to be the children of God. Walk back with me to Matthew chapter 5. Notice that the the language was 
that when you do everything without grumbling and complaining, it's so that you might prove yourselves to be the children of God. Are you with me? Walk with me to Matthew 5, verse 43. Matthew 5, verse 43. Here it is, and we're done. Listen to this. Do everything without grumbling and complaining. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Not even the tax collectors do the same. That's the non-believers. If you greet your brothers, what reward do you have uh, uh, as, you do, as, as you do others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect even as your father is perfect. Notice what he said. Pray for your enemy. Pray for those, I mean, pray for those that persecute you. Pray for your enemy. Love your enemy. And prove to be the children of the father. See, whenever God puts you and I in difficult situations, what it really does is it proves who we are. It is the proof of our faith in difficulties that we prove to be the children of God through the most difficult circumstances. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. How many of y'all love Jesus? Pray for your enemies. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But God demonstrated his love while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, we want to read verses in the Bible. We don't want to do verses in the Bible. Real proof of faith comes when you're in the difficult situations of life and you show off the glory of God in the midst of it. But watch this. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, which literally means this. You have to be thinking about Christianity all day, every day. You got to be thinking about Christ all day, every day. So when foolish stuff comes up in your life, you got a mind of Christ to work in that situation. Otherwise, that fleshly Blake is going to come out and act a fool. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Lord, we pray, God, that you will grow us and mature us through our time in the Word. And God, Lord, we recognize that there are various situations, even in the lives of our brothers and sisters in the room right now, God, give us that mind of Christ that we might live out and prove.